You may be seated. Before I lead in a word of prayer, I probably should have mentioned this during the announcement time. I uh, welcomed Leo and Nancy this morning, and uh, the last time they were with us, I mentioned to them that I'd like to get the church to go down to visit the Jenny Museum. Now, they're directors at the Jenny Museum, and they give tours. And you folks have a, uh, you're opening up in April, is that correct? April 5th. April 5th. So uh, we're going to talk about that. Uh, a great, great history of the pilgrims coming over. You know, we're like, what, 18, you know, 18 miles from Plymouth. And uh, so much history here. And uh, so we're going to get that done. Uh, that's, that's a promise and a threat. Okay? <laughs> okay? All right. Uh, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, we come before your presence this morning, and as we uh, gather, we're reminded uh, that your mercies are greater than our sin, and uh, it's new every morning. Uh, we just uh, bless you uh, that you're so loving, kind, and you're so good, and you're so merciful that we might have access to the throne of grace. And we uh, come this morning, Lord, uh, boldly, uh, but humbly, uh, in, your, in your presence, uh, through prayer. And um, we want to acknowledge you as our Lord and our Savior, our God and our friend. Uh, as Abraham was called a friend of God, uh, as disciples, we're called your friends, and we bless you for that. We're even called your brothers, uh, brothers uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, we marvel at the thought in Scripture that we're joint heirs, we're co-heirs, and we will live and reign with him. And we uh, bless you for that. And we're so humbled this morning uh, uh, to be in your presence, uh, to be with brothers and sisters of like mind and faith. And Father, uh, as we just sung in our last prayer, um, may your Holy Spirit uh, stir our hearts this morning and uh, revive us again, uh, renew our spirits and our hearts uh, to the glory of Christ. Uh, that's why we're here, Lord, that we might hear your word, uh, that we might be encouraged and built up and renewed in spirit as your people, uh, as the church, uh, we pray. Uh, that we would be everything that uh, you desire and intend for us to be. Uh, Father, um, we think of those in our congregation who are uh, ill. Uh, think of especially of uh, Mike Shirtliff and his struggles. And uh, I pray, Father, today that you would allow him to sense your presence and that as he senses your presence, um, that there would be great, great joy that would flood his soul um, as he struggles. And I pray that that would also be true for Carol. Um, again, we lift up uh, Fred this morning, encourage his heart, uh, bless his heart. Also want to lift up um, Sandy. Thank you for uh, Sandy's love for the saints and for this church here for so many, many years. And um, we, uh, we give her to you afresh today, Lord. Revive her, her heart and her spirit uh, this hour, this day. Father, also uh, pray for our country, uh, ever mindful of our country, um, and ever mindful, Lord, that uh, we need a revival and uh, we're going to keep on asking you for that, Lord. Uh, if you uh, do not revive our country, uh, there is a little hope. And uh, not only for our society, but uh, in many respects for the world. Uh, we uh, ask and pray that you would raise up uh, godly people to assume uh, positions of government. Uh, we pray that you would put a great burden upon their hearts 
uh, to love you, uh, to love mercy, and to walk with you. And may they uh, be tremendous examples uh, for others that uh, hold like positions today. Uh, so we pray that you would raise people up. And Father, again, I pray if, if a revival uh, doesn't start with me, that it would start with somebody in this church or in this community or throughout this country. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would be pleased uh, to visit in a way where your people and your churches are on fire. Uh, that's my prayer. And that's the prayers of your people here today as uh, they unite uh, their hearts with uh, my uh, heart and my prayer. Uh, we bless you for this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Folks, I'd like to read from the Gospel of John, chapter 10. The Gospel of John, chapter 10. Verses 1 through 18. Gospel of John, chapter 10, verses 1 through 18. If you're using a church Bible, it is on page 1040. I'll help you get there real quick. Page 1040. Jesus said, I tell you the truth, the man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs up in by some other way as a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because he knows, because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All who ever came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to kill and to steal and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd of the sheep. The good sheep lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. And my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there, and, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it up from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This, I, this command I received from my Father. Thus uh, the reading of John's Gospel. Uh, amen. Um, we have our next song, uh, the Praise and Chorus, Cornerstone. You may stand. This morning's second scripture reading also from the Gospel of John. From the 13th chapter of John's Gospel, 
be reading verses 1 through 20. And in the church Bible, that'll be on page 1044. Again, the 13th chapter of John, the first 20 verses on page 1044. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said, not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. For I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill this passage of scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. I am telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. And when whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Incredible passages of scripture this morning. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, give us ears to hear this morning and hearts to receive. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, folks, uh, we've all heard uh, the expression, a day late, a dollar short. Um, maybe, perhaps, you know somebody that falls into that category. Maybe you can relate to it, right? Uh, this, is, this is me. This is the story of my life. Uh, if it were not true, I would be on time for everything, right, Jerry? Um, and if it, were, if it were not true, I'd have more money to boot. So, uh, anyway... If you think about this idiom, it basically boils down to missed opportunities and to be inexcusably un 
prepared for those opportunities. And so this morning I, I asked the question, how many times do we miss what God is trying to say to us or teach us? Every day, Every day, day late, dollar short, right? How many times? A lot. When you come to John chapter 13, uh, we actually see these truths surface. Take a look at verse 12, because Christ asked a profound question to his disciples. He says, do you know what I have done? Now, this is really, really important because this is another teaching moment that Christ shares with his disciples. And it's significant because you probably know this is the night before he dies. And it's also significant because on two prior occasions, remember that they were arguing about who was the greatest in the kingdom? So, as we, as we read this passage and as Jesus gave this teaching moment, it's designed to give pause. Because what it, what it does is it illustrates the humility of God. It demonstrates God's humility through and through. I mean, God is so humble, amen? This is incredible. And it, and it challenges us, not only in our actions, but in our preconceived notions of who God is. You know, we talk about knowing God. Part of the great, great humility. Now, the other thing I was thinking, you know, I look out over the congregation, we, we all come from different upbringings and walks of life. And wouldn't life be boring if we all had the same resume? I mean, we'd know it all, right? It'd be so uninteresting. But with all those different upbringings, we have formulated various opinions and views of God, have we not? Who He is, what He's like, His character, His disposition. I, I was brought up Roman Catholic. You know, so I always say, you know, you always had the sense that, you know, what God would squash you like a bug in a rug and He wouldn't really care too much, right? It's not unusual that people have different views of God in, in their upbringing. These views are, are, are shaped by life's experiences. They're, they're shaped by what we read or what we don't read. They may be thoroughly biblical. Or they may actually be lacking. You know, we may actually have somebody in our church today who is lacking greatly in the understanding of who God is. It's possible. Hopefully not. But this just simply underscores the principle that is put forth in Romans chapter 1. And the principle is that we bring God down into our own image. That's what we're really, really good at doing. We embrace Him on our own terms oftentimes. And this is why I naturally rationalize, and you naturally rationalize, and easily rationalize sin. We do. We do it all the time. God understands. We say, He's okay with it. I'm human. It's true that God fully understands. It's not true that God's okay with it. He, he, he sought to address it at Calvary. And so, this foot-washing account here not only underscores the humility of God, but I, I would suggest to you that it shakes the disciples' view of God in this moment to the core. They had a different view of their Savior up to this point. All of the disciples, except Peter, are either flabbergasted or too timid to even say anything. You know, the, the, you know the, their throats, you know, their tongues in their throat. Um, what, are they, what are they to say? I mean, if God were to show up right now and start washing your feet, you'd be like, what would you say? And you've you got to love Peter, right? Peter always gives it to you kind of straight. 
I, I love Peter. Uh, never had a problem speaking his mind. And, and you know, it's an either-or moment. Uh, I've been accused of that as well. Uh, that's what I have in common with Peter. It's, it's either a refreshing moment or it's an embarrassing moment, right? I look at this and I say, this foot washing ceremony challenged all of their views of who God was. Especially Peter. The view of deity, cultural and social views, personal and spiritual views. And you know, when, when our view of God is challenged, that is a good thing. Because, you know, what we want to do is, uh, you know, Bob Ganaway and I always talk about this, we want to put God in a nice little box, wrap him up real tight, because in this way we can control him. You see, we're, we're comfortable with the God that's all packaged neatly and wrapped. Now, when, when I talk about being challenged in our views of God, I'm talking about being Holy Spirit challenged. I'm not talking about some whimsical, faulty, or unbiblical view of God. And there are plenty out there, folks, trust me. But, you know, I was reflecting on this. I think we need to take pause. We need to be stretched. And we need to be humbled. Amen? I know I do. Uh, second, uh, uh, Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, speaks of the fullness of deity dwelling in Christ in bodily form. I have a dear friend in ministry, and he always speaks about giving people a full Christ. That's a huge challenge today in our churches in this culture. Uh, Jane Campbell sent me some emails the last couple of weeks where um, this huge Christian organization who um, does adoption, right? Beth, is it Bethany? Bethany Christian Services. Bethany Christian Services. They're now putting children with homosexual couples. I mean, people... It's, it's hard to give people a full Christ today. You're under pressure. We're living in a day and age where people want their ears tickled. They want softball Christianity. They want the warm and fuzzy and not the hard sayings of Christ. And, and, and you know, and we've talked about this. They're going to corner you, and they're going to out you, and they're going to make life very, very difficult for you if you don't conform. World Vision, the, 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 the current CEO of Bethany Christian Services, was with World Vision. They started doing that back in 2014. You know, you talk about kids growing up being messed up today. That's, it. That's insane. Many churches are not giving a full Christ and a full gospel today and they're being culturally swept away and deceived. Their view of God brought down into their own image. Some churches, the liberal churches, go more to the humanity side of our Savior. They get rid of the Lord standard, right? Anything goes. Some, more, some churches go more to the Lordship side, the conservative churches, but here's the problem with that. You know, we sung about mercy and grace this morning. A lot of times they drop that. They don't show mercy and grace. They'll stone you on the way out. And they may even stone you on the way in. I, I pray to God that, that we keep the, the fullness of Christ, the fullness of His Lordship, and the fullness of his humanity. Uh, love covers a multitude of sins. I will never, ever, ever throw a stone at you on the way in or the way out. And I will not let any Christian brother or sister here do the same to anyone else in this church. Not going to have it. Will not have it. Scripture presents both sides. Lordship 
humanity. As Lord, he greatly detests sin, and yet as the Son of Man, grace and mercy abound, and he humbly dies for it. That's, you know, that's, that's balance. That's a gospel. That's a full gospel. And, and so, so I asked this, this question uh, again, because uh, Jesus asked it of the disciples, uh, do you understand what I have done? Uh, Mark chapter 10, verse 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and give his life a ransom for many. Do you know, God has come to serve each and every one of us. That should challenge our view of God. The, the humility of God here is, is the huge takeaway. And, 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 of course, the additional takeaway is that as we imitate him, we will serve him as we serve others likewise. It's, it's, this is incredible. This is this absolutely incredible passage of Scripture. Uh, let, me, let me break it down to you another way. There is nothing that God will not do for each and every one of us in the humble or humility category. This is not like a name it, claim it. But there is nothing that God would not do for you in this category. He's the great shepherd of the sheep. If you know anything about shepherding and sheep keeping, I did a sermon on that years ago. There's a great book, by the way. Uh, it's on Psalm 23. Uh, I can't think of the title, but it's a great, great book. Uh, Jane, you know it. You're shaking your head. It's a great, great book. It's a little paperback, about maybe 100 pages. And it's, it, it's a perspective of Psalm 23. A shepherd's perspective. It's absolutely incredible. There is nothing that the Lord Jesus Christ will not do to serve you and me. He came to serve. I was, I was sitting in a church service about four or five years ago, and the pastor said, God is not here to serve you. You're here to serve him. It's like, I don't, I think we're here to serve him, but I think he's got that wrong a little bit. You know, sometimes... As pastors, we say things wrong. But foot washing to the cross, he's done it all. Amen? The A and the Z of the alphabet when it comes to humility. Condescending from heaven's throne, condescending to be, for, be born flesh and blood, condescending to a servant's profile. Inner garments, he, he, he takes his outer garments off wraps himself with a towel, fills a basin, everything that a servant would do, and he washes some pretty, dirty, filthy, smelly, ugly, and maybe deformed feet. That's, that's the humility of God. Condescending to the cross to become sin. Ugliness, filth. And this is how he fulfills the role of suffering servant. Isaiah 53. Take a look at uh, verse 1. The scripture says, Having loved his own who were in the world, he, he loved them to the end. That is the uttermost. Uh, generally, the interpretation here is to the end of his natural life. But as I look at context here and everything else, uh, four days later, Jesus resurrected and he was alive. And so it, it, it may be natural life in its strictest interpretation, but it goes well into eternity. And does not he love us well into eternity? That's the gospel of Christ. Of course he does. Tremendous truths. We are living in a time where there's little to no humility. You see it on the football field. It kills me. I love ice hockey. It's starting to, to pervade or invade the ice, ice hockey world. They were always generally very gracious, even though they would like to fight a lot from time to time. But, you know, there's, there's just arrogance abounds. Little to no humility, especially in government, positions of authority. 
We've talked about this. You see the news. You read it. Raw political power. Raw military power. Raw defiance of surveillance in your Fourth Amendment. You can't go down the highway without them taking a picture of everything. Tyrannical leadership abounds from governors to mayors, even to your selectmen. Always pull on a fast one. Tell me, I, I seriously ask you, how many of these people at the head of positions in government would wash your feet or wash my feet? Or the feet of the people that they govern? Or shall I say, lord it over? Most of them wouldn't even throw their constituents a towel, let alone give a brother or sister in Christ one. I could actually see the response. I don't have time. Go get it yourself. I have other things to do. That's the world, folks. Servanthood is a lost virtue today, is it not? You even see it in ministry. No one would ever write a book about me, but I, I pray to God that that would never happen. That the book should always be about Christ. Amen? Always lift him up. Yeah, servanthood's a lost virtue today from government to business, from church to nonprofit. It's, it's insane. Take a look at verse 13 here. Did you, did you notice that Jesus acknowledged that he was Lord and teacher? Uh, folks, it's about servanthood regardless of position. It's about love and humility regardless of position. It's putting others first. That's the example that Jesus gives us here. The way you want to really understand this is that uh, Jesus totally violates the, the cultural and social norms here that, and boundaries that were assumed in this society. So think about this. Messiah is not supposed to wash feet. What is he supposed to do? He's supposed to be crowned, and he's supposed to get a ruling position. And this, is many, this explains in many respects why Peter was indignant. I mean, remember, Peter is the one who said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And, and, and I go back, for Peter and the disciples, it was all about position. You know, going back to the book, uh, Shepherd Looks at Psalm 23, it, 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 I remember him saying that sheep headbutt for position, push each other out of the way. We have the, the, two, the two cats, I'm telling you, they, when we dump food into the little pen, they go crazy. And, I mean, you know, one will be sitting on the other's head just to get to the food. It's insane. They're actually cute, but it's insane. Right, right Marie, you've, you've, seen the, you've seen the cat thing before. It's all about position. That, doesn't that sound like our culture today? Jesus uh, put an, uh, an end to that notion real quick, real quick. Uh, the IVP commentary referenced a rabbi who lived around 220 AD. The guy's name was Rabbi Judah Hanasi. And uh, it's said of him, uh, he was said to be so humble that he would do anything for others except relinquish his position, his superior position. And I, I'm actually looking at this, I'm thinking that's, that's actually kind of laughable because a servant is always willing to relinquish their position. Hey, look, anybody want this right now? You, you can have this. You can have this pulpit if you want. <laughs> Any, anytime. Remember, remember Moses? I'm not talking about Moses Ephraim, who was born last Monday. I'm talking about the Moses back in Exodus, right? God shows up to him, and what does he say? Moses, I want you to, and he's got four excuses. 
And Moses was humble. He didn't, he didn't want the position. Uh, remember George Washington? You know, the guy that they're trying to tear down the statues about? Uh, as I understand it, he took the presidency reluctantly. Uh, we need people today of humble character like these people. Willing to wash feet and serve. Humble. Take a, take a look at verses 6 through 8 here. Uh, Peter, uh, Lord, um, do you wash my feet? You going to wash mine? No, nah, I don't think so. Uh, and then uh, doubles down, um, may, uh, you shall never wash my feet. May it never be, so to speak. And so, to Peter, Jesus is doing the unthinkable. It doesn't fit his view of Messiah. It doesn't fit his view of Jesus as Lord and Teacher. It doesn't fit the cultural norms. Think about this. He's actually unwilling to let Christ serve him. And then when he's faced with the alternative, if you don't let me wash, then you have no part. And then classic Peter, my hands, my feet, my head. <laughs> I'm all in. I, I have a bunch of questions to ask this morning. Are we willing to accept help from the Lord Jesus Christ? Are we willing to let him serve us? Are we willing to let him wash our feet, so to speak? Are we willing to receive help and assistance from others in Jesus' name? Are we willing to render help and assistance to others in Jesus' name? It's one thing to receive. It's another thing to be willing to do. Are we willing to do menial tasks like Jesus? Are we willing to get our hands dirty? In a good way, not in a bad way. I met a guy out here this past week about changing the sign. And I told him about my business. And he says, what do you, what do you haul? And I said, well, not dead bodies. <laughs> but we'll, we'll do anything, you know, uh, that, that is honest and sometimes dirty and, you know, Menial tasks like Jesus. Take a look at verse 7. <laughs> Jesus says, What I do, you do not realize now, but you shall understand later. Day late, dollar short, totally me. Um, a lot of things don't occur to me when God's trying to teach me. Maybe you feel the same way. Don't always understand it right away. Maybe we can look at this passage three, four months from now, say, wow, I never saw that before. It, it comes down to discernment. What is God trying to teach me? And I think it's fair to say that human nature is such that it gravitates to seeking power, lording it over others, tyran tyranny is the outcome, enslaving others is the end result. You, you read the end of Revelation, right? You, you're not going to be able to buy or sell. Control. Enslavement. A mark. That's the way of the world. It's not the way of God. It's the way of pride and not the way of humility. And as I, as I look at this, Peter may not have understood everything that was going on, but I, I can tell you, and even though his view of God was that, you know, he would assume a position and usher in the kingdom, Peter did not let pride ultimately stand in the way of him receiving from Christ. That's, that's a huge, huge thought here, folks. Does our pride stand in the way of a cleansing relationship with God? Or are we willing to let him wash our feet and our hands and our head? I've been there, folks. Pride. 
It's a big factor that keeps people from coming to God. It's a big, big factor in maintaining fellowship, that sweet fellowship, right? I, I love saying this. I look out, many of you are older than I am, right? Or some of you are older than I am. You've seen more, you've been more around the block. Tell me, doesn't pride get in the way of a lot of things? Of course it does. It gets in the way of humility. It gets in the way of relationships. I know people that haven't talked for years to their own brothers or sisters. They won't humble themselves. They won't show forgiveness. They won't receive forgiveness. They won't confess to God and they won't ask forgiveness from other people. Uh, John tells us in his epistle that the boastful pride of life is not from the Father. One final thought here uh, before I close, but um, I hope it did not escape your notice, but Jesus washed the feet of Judas. Ah, that's where I'm challenged, folks. I don't I'll wash your feet. I'll wash a lot of people's feet, but wash the feet of my enemies? That's a tough one. I've had some people really, really hurt me through the years. I don't want to even see them, let alone wash their feet. And so, again, it challenges me this morning in terms of my view of God and what he would do for others. You know what? It's actually so sad, too, because... Never touched the heart of Judas, did it? Pride. Uh, in closing, from foot washing to the cross, uh, Christ's humility is not limited to one or two days here, like the night before he died and when he goes to Calvary. You know you read the Gospels, right? It was in his entire life. It was in his entire ministry. And Mark's Gospel expounds on the fact uh, of the Gospel um, uh, he presents Christ as the servant. Everything he sees through his lens, Christ is the servant. That's beautiful, beautiful gospel. So as I close, uh, I remind you there is nothing that God would not do for you or me in the humble category. Uh, may we take that thought this morning. Uh, and go and do likewise uh, for others, and maybe even our enemies. Not, not maybe even, even our enemies. Uh, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, I pray that you would give me the grace uh, to wash the feet of my enemies and I pray that that would be true for everyone in this place today. Uh, may we show the love and the kindness and the humility of God our Savior. And uh, may we take it to heart. Uh, thank you, Lord. It's not about a position. We're all one in Christ. And uh, we're all here to uh, lift you up and to uh, serve you up to one another and to those outside uh, this building. And we pray that you would give us uh, grace and inroads to be able to do that. Uh, prepare our hearts for uh, communion this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.